And we're right on noon now, so I'll take the chance to introduce our next invited speaker, Dr. Kurt Squire, who is about to help us understand an area that is <clears throat> very important to a lot of us language teachers, that is games. Dr. Squire is a professor of informatics and co-director of the Games Plus Learning Plus Society Center at UC Irvine. And his scholarship has contributed to understandings of game-based learning and game design. So after this session, I really encourage you to go explore the great links and resources you can find at his speaker information page. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Squire. Thank you, thank you. Um, I apologize about the dog barking. Um, uh, ah, hold on, let me get, grab my uh, slides here. My um, uh, wife, Constance, who spoke a little earlier, just, um, just arrived home and the dog is very excited. <laughs> So she uh, she may be coming to grab her in a second. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about games learning, uh, particularly coming out of the pandemic. Um, uh, so I want to talk about language learning, but what I'd like to do with this session is try to take a little bit of a step back and think about use games as a way for thinking about how um, how technologies work, how we use them for learning, and how what their role may be in the language classroom. Uh, now, I should say I am not a language educator. I'm a games uh, educator. Um, a lot of my research and career, I'm a former Montessori teacher, actually. I'm a former teacher who got interested in games, particularly um, at the time, like VR was kind of hot. And with all the, all the new sort of emerging technologies for learning happening, I got just really interested in what was happening with games and could we use them for instructional purposes? Um, I should also say my mother is a German teacher, so I was raised by language uh, teachers, <laughs> so I have at least some instincts about, about the topic, I think. Um, but um, the most recently, the last four or five years, I've been teaching in a games program, so I teach aspiring game developers who want to go make World of Warcraft or Starcraft or Fortnite or whatever, um, and so I'm teaching game designers most of the time. Um, so um, hopefully, so what I want to do is, uh, is try to share some thoughts I've had about teaching and learning during the pandemic, some of the work that we've designed around games, and then hopefully that'll get you thinking about your work in some interesting ways. Um, one reason I, I, I do also, I should say, I do track language and learning games uh, in part because uh, language teachers have been, uh, in my career, and even thinking back to my mom, uh, among the most sort of aggressively uh, adopt media adopters, I found. Um, it's very common for people to use media for learning when you're teaching language. I know my mom always had German music around the house, German shows, uh, she subscribed to German magazines and just kind of left them around the house for us. So um, I think of that spirit, this is a, a community that's oftentimes on the cutting edge. Um, now the pandemic was a really interesting time for me personally because one of the um, key games that has been in, in my career is something called Virulent. This is a game that we designed working with virologists and immunologists at Wisconsin to help the public understand how viruses attack cells. So most of what happened during the pandemic, um, and I've gotten in arguments with you know, friends of mine around misinformation and so on, uh, but most of that experience came from designing a game um, around uh, viruses. So if you're interested in that kind of work, I have a game so I have a book um, that just came out from MIT Press called Making Games for Impact that talks about designing these games. This is another game we designed for social and emotional learning. Um, another one we designed that's around uh, astronomy. Most of the games that we've been doing were around science concepts. So those aren't uh, may or may not be of interest to people in this virtual room. So I'm not going to uh, talk as much about it as, as one could, I guess. Um, but one thing I, I do want to sort of pivot to, to thinking about are, you know, if we look at what happened with games in the pandemic, we saw a couple of things happening. So these are my two kids here, um, Walter and Warner. Um, they've grown a lot during the pandemic, but they spent most of their time uh, during the pandemic playing games. And so we saw a real resurgence of games, particularly, it makes sense, right? We're all kind of stuck in our offices or our homes. Um, but we turned to games for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they became a place to socialize and hang out with friends. Um, two, they were a place that we went for looking for cozy relationships. That's uh, Animal Crossing on the top left. Some of you may have played. 
Um, and then games like World of Warcraft that gave us a sense of progress or feeling like, oh, you know, I'm, I may not getting to go through any adventures stuck in my home, or I might not, you know, get to meet new people. But in a game like World of Warcraft, I possibly can. Um, now, it's interesting to contrast that as for me as a parent, looking at what my kids could do at Minecraft, World of Warcraft, um, even Animal Crossing, versus what they were being asked to do in school. Um, so um, there were actually examples of kids uh, using Minecraft, right, to hold virtual ceremonies. This was a quarantine university that some kids made as a way of being able to hold their, their own um, graduation ceremonies in Minecraft, right? Minecraft went, went spiked huge, hugely, I hate that word, but uh, Minecraft play, player bases uh, absolutely spiked during, during COVID, partly nostalgia, partly the creativity that people could do, and then partly as a place they could go with friends, right? It's a place you could go and hang out and be co-present. Um, so yeah, games uh, were up uh, across the board during pandemic. Thankfully, they've maybe gone down a little bit. You may have seen Netflix subscriptions have gone down. So I'm personally cheering this. This is great. It means we're getting back out and talking to friends in real life again. Um, World of Warcraft, um, a game where I spent a lot of time. Um, and one of the reasons that people, I think, went to games like this were something called Progress Quest. So this uh, slide that um, the little picture I have on the bottom is it an old indie game from like 20 years ago. But the idea was trying to mock how games like World of Warcraft gave us this sense of progress, right? You could log in, you've got a level. Um, outside, it felt like nothing was changing. You know, there's nothing going on new or I'm just the same person. Maybe I'm gaining weight, if anything. <laughs> but uh, a game like World of Warcraft gives you this illusion of progress, this sort of dopamine rushes that we get by having goals, you're constantly attaining a goal and moving up. Now, I'm gonna argue that's something in the language world that we see something like Duolingo doing really well. Um, I am someone who actually about a year ago quit World of Warcraft because I've been playing far too much and I felt like I was leveling up my virtual character. And, and for me, honestly, I was getting a little bit depressed the more I was spending in a space that ultimately didn't matter. So I um, picked up Duolingo and I thought, well, at least I could be learning something new. Um, I have also then abruptly quit after about three months, um, which I want, I'll talk more about in a second. But I think that's what these games do well, right? They, uh, in games is maybe a stretch, but these kinds of learning systems, they give you a sense of progress where you are unlocking new badges and so on. Now, um, I think we've seen as language teachers, I, I bet you all know the limitations uh, as well or better than I do. Uh, but I do think they have tools like this can have a role in so much as they give us this sort of um, progress, right? You get these these um, sort of, yeah, this, um, uh, steady progress, a chance to go back and make mistakes. I don't know how many people would use it. I'd be curious to hear how many people are using things like this and what they feel about them. Um, I, my own feeling right now is like, sure, that's a great homework kind of, uh, you know, way you can go. Although interesting, my son who's learning Spanish does not use it and is kind of uninterested in it. Um, the second thing that we've seen though during COVID with technology is a sense of what a group of game designers have called cozy games. And that is games that are trying to help you feel a sense of comfort, of uh, uh, picking up on a lot of pastoral themes. Uh, Hearthstone's another game that is that is that tries to be cozy where you go like, oh, I'm gonna go there to feel kind of um, good and, and um, uh, a sense of comfort. Um, we also saw though, um, people wanting to maybe think through or, uh, uh, a mix of wanting to learn about things like viruses, but then also wanting to play through some of their perhaps fears. So um, people may be familiar with the game Plague Inc. It was in the top 10 ever really since the iPads had started, but it's a game where you are trying to destroy humanity by engineering a virus. Um, it shot back up the charts. It's been in the top 10 again, like I mentioned for the last about decade. It was actually banned in China um, for a little while, which is kind of interesting. Uh, people were really concerned, I guess, that. I don't know what they were concerned. Um, I, won't, I won't get into the politics of Chinese uh, media censorship, but it was actually banned for a little while. Um, but the idea is that it's a game where you're trying to engineer a virus that can um, wipe out the world, which if nothing else, it does suggest to me where the interesting spots with games are. So this is 
uh, like a hard science fiction game. It's not meant to be educational, but it's accurate enough that the lead developer was uh, brought to the CDC in the United States to talk with them about, about how can we design games that can help inform the public. Um, and it pulls on the sense of transgressive play, which I think is part of where there are interesting opportunities around language games that we can maybe talk more about. Um, so I mentioned, yeah, Virulent, this was a game that we designed. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, James Vaughn, who was um, brought to the CDC to tell, talk with them about how we can actually try to use games to inform the public. Um, oh, kind of also funny, uh, <laughs> Kyle Orland, who's actually a, a friend of mine, wrote this uh, article on uh, there was a, a lot of concern that people might actually be trying to use this game for scientific modeling, which is kind of hilarious, right? Um, but it does hopefully actually give us a, a, some insights into thinking about models, right? We, we, you um, Probably beyond the scope of this talk, but playing with games like this, you start to understand what models do well and, and don't do well. Um, so again, this game did quite well during the pandemic. Um, so what other kinds of things are we looking for during a time of pandemic? And then what might it teach us about, about language learning? And I'm going to um, go to where I think what we, what kinds of things we might be able to do a little bit better as educators, uh, myself included. So um, one of my favorite examples of these cozy games was um, Animal Crossing, right, which was released during pandemic. It feels like five years ago, if you know this game, but it was actually like two. Um, and this is this idea of coziness, right, that we're looking Oftentimes we are looking for games that might help us feel a sense of warmth, of connection, connection to other people. And for language learners, I think this is an important idea. Many of the games that you see that are cozy games have also been taken up by users organically to learn second languages. So Animal Crossing is a game that has been, um, now these are mostly just reports, like if you Google language learning games, and I, I tend to catch a lot of these just as a games educator, um, I'll, people will come up to me and say, oh, you know, a lot of either learned English or another language by playing a game like uh, Animal, through playing Animal Crossing. Um, there are a couple others that come up, but this is one of the games that people sort of talk to and uh, talk about, sorry, as games that they use for um, second, like L2 sort of language learning. Um, in part because it's a safe atmosphere, a lot of the sort of nouns and verbs are relatively introductory. Um, and this is the kind of thing I might be uh, consider, I'll talk some tips at kind of at the end, but this is the kind of game I would possibly consider someone picking up in a second language. Um, but I, I have to show this just because it was fun. Um, there were some great examples of, of, of cozy gameplay happening. So while Twitter can be kind of uh, hostile at times, um, lately it's kind of particularly bad. Um, there were some really great examples, like this is the Museum of Rural English Splice that held a design competition where people were encouraged to go into Animal Crossing and design smocks. These are rural smocks, um, so clothing. Um, and they had a, a thread where people could log in, design their characters, talk about what they made. So what you're seeing here that's, I think, interesting for language creator, uh, language instructors are organic uses of games where people are, are making things and using the game as a sort of creation tool. And with Animal Crossing is again, another sort of game where we might think about uh, using it for the purposes of language learning, uh, much as you know people watch soap operas or consume other forms of media, this might be a type of media that you could do. I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but one of the things one, and maybe folks are doing this, I'd love to hear more about it if you are, but is think about taking something like Animal Crossing and designing, uh, playing it in a second language and then designing things around it and or playing on servers where uh, if you're like Korean learning English, playing on English speaking servers where you can interact with people in, in another language. Um, um, but what, what really struck me watching, again, my kids play these games, so these are all places that you go, and they're places that you can go to be with your friends. In contrast to something like Duolingo, or even our kids' classrooms, right? So they, they were spent time learning earth science, Spanish, right, um, on Canvas. Canvas or our online learning systems are not places that you can go, and they're not places you can interact with other people. And uh, really, even the same with, say, Duolingo, right? You can add friends and maybe see their progress, but you can't really interact in a meaningful way. Now, we all, I think, 
intuitively know some of the reasons why, right? There's a real concern about, about toxicity, um, which is legitimate. But, um, but I think the challenge for us as educators is can we create and use game technologies, not just for that sense of progress, or not even um, only for the emotional sort of feelings that can help us give us, but a sense of presence that uh, particularly social presence and co-presence. But when we think about language, I think in particular, the idea that you could be talking and communicating with people um, is something they can do. Now in classrooms, right, we can hopefully do some of this. We can divide into groups, we can talk to each other. But I think for language, this is a real opportunity and this is the place where um, maybe we as designers on my end still are not really doing enough, right? We have not created a, a, a deep, you know, a place where you can really interact in a deep and meaningful way online. Now, there are examples of uh, travel games. This is a, a Assassin's Creed. You can play Assassin's Creed where you can go across any number of different cultures and time and places. Um, they have now Egypt. They have a, a tour around historical Rome. They have many, if you're, uh, again, probably not for this crowd, but it's something you might check out if you're interested. There are now versions of these games that are made for educational purposes uh, in cons consultation with real historians, but there's not, they're still pretty flat, right? There's no sense of social presence that you're really being with, you're really experiencing with people, uh, things with other people in real time. Now, um, I talk a little bit about this in the paper that I submitted for the conference. There are examples of language teachers taking things like Minecraft, which if I were pressed, like if I were thrown in the right now where I had to try to use a game for the purposes of language learning, this is probably what I would do. I probably would um, try to find a, another language version of Minecraft and build a server where people were interacting simply in that second language. Um, uh, there are uh, some resources on there. I looked a little into this uh, teacher, Glenn Irvin's classroom. Um, this is the kind of environment where you really can get co-presence pretty easily. That's sort of, you know, kind of what people, what people have and do. Um, there are other examples like MUDs and text-based games, but I think Again, I think Minecraft might be an interesting place if you wanted to use this sort of game that goes out of it. But the second thing I want to talk about are forms of place-based games. Now, these are games that are built around particular neighborhoods or places. And the idea is that you are helping people sort of leave the classroom and using the world around you kind of as a game board. Um, we've designed a couple of these games. Uh, some colleagues of mine have designed them for language learning, and there's some evidence that they can work. I think like all you know, educational media, it depends on the kids and the ages and what you're trying to do. But this is a thing that you might be able to do kind of more like tomorrow if you're interested in trying to use techniques from games um, without having a budget to build a new game in 3D or something. Um, this might be something you could do. And so um, these are games that are a lot like Pokemon Go. So I imagine a lot of us have played Pokemon Go, but the idea is that you are going out uh, much, well, so Pokemon Go takes the real world and then like sprinkles Pokemon around them. You might think about building games that you can, um, and there are tools for doing this either on phones or you can even just grab paper. I would actually prototype this with paper before I would even necessarily use a device. Um, where you build, you basically build a language game around the world around you. So to give you an example, this is a game that a seventh grader designed about his local neighborhood. So he lived in this neighborhood, you can kind of see that in the middle of the screen there. And what he did was went out and this was not, this was a history game, I should say, this was not a, a language learning game explicitly. Um, but what he did was went out in the neighborhood, he learn the history behind who lived in what buildings, what was there. Um, this, particular this particular community had been a mix of immigrants of, uh, it's, this was in Madison, Wisconsin, but it was a mix of Italians, of um, Jewish Americans, of African Americans that were historically there. So he built a history time travel game where you went back in time to um, like 40 years ago and he got historical pictures of what was there 
Um, and he actually had the kids do the research to go kind of door to door and say, we're building a game about time travel. Do you know who lived in this house? They found some old residents who had pictures of the neighborhood. Um, and then they built that on these, uh, these are old, like before iPhones, you can see that digital device over there. But what I like about this was that it really got kids out in their neighborhoods, talking to people, um, gathering resources, building, you know, they were the creators of the game. Um, and they were creating games for other people to play. And this sort of model is one that I think for language learning could be particularly interesting just because you could, um, you know, have, uh, uh, well, depending on where you are, you can have people designing games or game like experiences for other languages. Um, so in this, in this instance, what the kids had to do was again, design, he, his task was to design a game. So he found, uh, he interviewed people, found characters, he created characters based around the people he talked to. Um, this picture in the bottom, the Italian, Italian Workmen's Club, was um, a, uh, a community hall of Italian immigrants who had moved there, moved to the neighborhood, and it was a place you could go and find support. So he uh, got really interested in this idea um, because it's a, you know, it's a really powerful idea, right? The idea that immigrants would have community spaces that they own and run and would support one another. And he thought that was really cool. So um, he designed a character um, who, in this case, you can read the dialogue. So Samuel, I can't believe anyone wants to tear down the green bush. The idea was that in the 1960s, they wanted to tear down this neighborhood and they actually did. The city actually did tear down many buildings. Um, and he says, it's too nice. Everyone loves it here. There's no vandalism. It's only places people can afford to live. No one locks their doors, which was all things that he had um, heard other people say about what life was like in this neighborhood 40 or 50 years ago. Um, so he basically talked to people, had them design characters around it. Um, and for language learning, again, it's an idea, something you might play around with, the idea that you could have kids or students go and research different areas and build them around. Like if I were, if it were me doing something like second language, I might think about a tourism game where you're designing neighborhood tours or something around a language that is not their uh, first language for other people to, to learn, you know, about what's, what's happening. Um, this, this case, something that was kind of fun, this is one of the students who designed the game and they did so much research on this neighborhood that the city council, um, they, well, after they designed their neighborhood game around the green bush here, um, they drafted a piece of legislation for the city of Madison to have this neighborhood honored because it was, again, it was torn down and gentrified and was uh, changing very quickly. So they wanted to uh, honor its memories. So they had a piece of legislation written. This is one of the kids who went to the city council and presented this, this uh, game and the work that they had done. They actually held an annual uh, Greenbush Day every year. Uh, there's a, a festival now in honor of the neighborhood. Um, but it's a kind of community engagement that is really exciting to me when I think about language learning, particularly, you know, this is based on my experience in the United States. I've been to Korea once. I think there probably are some similar ideas one could do. But the idea is that you would try to use, try to break down the boundaries of the classroom with something like games and then have kids designing games or other playful experiences around it. Now, this is the one game I know of that was uh, a language game built with similar ideas. So Chris Holden, who was a former student of mine, uh, went to New Mexico and he was um, interested in these sort of place-based games. He worked on this, this project here. But as he went to New Mexico, he met a colleague, Julie Sykes, and he started thinking, you know, it's interesting that we are learning Spanish in New Mexico, where all of these people are speaking Spanish outside the classroom. So could we design a game where we get them to go outside and try to practice speaking Spanish and interacting with communities? So he um, designed a game that was designed to take people into Spanish speaking neighborhoods so they could practice uh, speaking Spanish, um, particularly going into areas where they might not feel as comfortable. Um, so you might think of the game here as, searching as, as serving as kind of a scaffolding to say like, it's okay. I know that maybe you're, um, you think of yourself as white or you're white and you might not feel comfortable going into some of these places, but we're going to scaffold an interaction. And what was kind of cool is he talked to the business owners and said, I'm designing a game to try to bring people from the University of New Mexico into Spanish speaking neighborhoods, 
know, they might be willing, they might be spending money in your store. Um, and in this case, it was a historical game based on some, again, some historical um, events that happened in this neighborhood. Um, but it was trying to get people to feel more connected, to actually use language, to then also feel more comfortable speaking language in, you know, in, uh, in Spanish speaking communities. So trying to use games ability to immerse you in, in new language contexts. Um, something I love that was brilliant about this, I thought, was that, you know, you could imagine building like a whole Spanish speaking world in Second Life or something like that. And instead he's like, why, you know, well, let's just go outside. <laughs> let's go outside and, and then using the game as a series of scaffolded interactions. Um, um, I can talk a little bit more about this, but we've, we've had pretty good luck. In fact, well, here, I'm gonna jump to it real quickly. Um, this image you can see up here where the kids are walking around with phones and, and, and notebooks. Um, we've designed a lot of games for the phone where you go into neighborhoods and, and sort of talk, but a lot of times we have a hard time getting the kids to put their phone down. So we also have done paper-based prototypes with just clipboards. And to be honest, I, I would probably rather have them go off with clipboards. Like um, the ability to just like put your phone down and actually talk to someone. You know, it's a little easier if you're not constantly going back and forth. So we did a lot of our prototypes with clipboards. And there was one where <laughs> my students around this project right here, where they said, you know, the, the grant was funded by the Department of Education. So it was for use of technology. And one of the lead designers came to the conclusion at the end, there was like, I'm not sure the phone, like, I'm not sure that the technology is helping in this case. Now, there are some things you can do, like you can, I guess you can have virtual characters, you can have, you can play sounds, you can play videos. But at that point, you know, it, it was just, anyway, it's kind of interesting that that was kind of where we went. So um, things I'm thinking about are how can we use technologies to increase this sort of so social presence or or how can we use games or at least bring more of a playful kind of spirit? Um, there is um, a body of research that I've become much more interested really in the last just couple of weeks are some of the research around just simply play, particularly social play. The moment you say to someone, hey, you know, do you wanna play a game? Do you wanna do something playful? Um, it does trigger whole different parts of the brain. And there's some interesting sort of emerging research around this that again, if I want, wanted to, um, take this kind of work moving forward, I think the interesting opportunities are literally telling people like those business owners here, like, hey, we have students who are playing a game. So I know that, you know, I know you're running a shop, but we're gonna have some kids come in here like in a scavenger hunt kind of way. And would you be willing to help them play, play this way? Because it invites a spirit of learning that um, is, is uh, take some of the social pressure off of everyone having to speak perfect, you know, speak a perfect language or whatever. And the idea that you're actually embracing a playful spirit. There's some research around this that it's really good for learning. And I think in the case of language learning, it might help reduce some of these barriers that kind of hold us back. Um, so after COVID, some of the things I'm really thinking about a lot, having watched, well, ha for me, having taught over Zoom, having watched my kids learn through Zoom, um, and what I'm, what I'm trying to reflect on, I guess, having watched how we learn through games, like why, why were everyone playing games? What did we take? What did we take to games? What can we maybe learn from games? Um, are a couple of these things. So number one, can we, when we are in classrooms, can we, ah, sorry, I'm trying to look at some last parts of my slide here, but um, how can we create real places um, where real world gets done, whether it be using our classroom time, you know, in a classic kind of flip way. So we really do have people coming to classes to talk and, and I've already fallen back into it, I guess where I'm lecturing too much, but I'm at least trying to be more bold about not talking as much and letting them talk more with each other. Um, because if you're going to be face to face, that's the thing that we can do when we're in groups. Um, you know, there's a lot of YouTube, like there's an infinite number of YouTube videos online, right? Um, the second one I think is that I at least, I'm gonna go back a little bit, but I, something that really struck me looking at all of these screens um, and watching my kids or that so much of what we do in online education is just, you know, students reading text, manipulating text, spitting text back, right? And this is called, this is called textualism and instructional design. The idea is that you present people, kids or learners text and then they memorize it and then they shoot it back at you, which, you know, in language has its place for sure. But um, can we also really, when we do have
things like classroom experiences or when we are using technologies, can we do something more than only that? So again, I, I would argue that Duolingo and things like it have their place and they are certainly, if people want to use them, they're great. But what kinds of learning experiences, either with AIMS or without them, can we do toward these embodied understandings, like getting people out in the world talking to each other or using the classrooms under that? Um, so for me, the other challenge is how do we think beyond just games or other media as content delivery platforms, but places that can facilitate embodied social co-presence? Um, again, for me, if I'm if I'm trying to experiment with that right now, Minecraft would be probably the simplest way because it's like a massively multiplayer game for free. Um, depending on the age, it's kind of interesting now, like the Minecraft generation is now starting to come to college. So I'm getting to the point now where I can say, you know, how many of you own Minecraft? And like most of them do, which is also kind of interesting to say, well, okay, well, let's try to do something in Minecraft because you already um, sort of do it. Um, there's a this idea in the field called sequestered learning that I don't know if, if it's, um, it's a one you might you're familiar with, but it was a, a term that came up about 20 years ago to talk about assessment. Um, and this idea is that we, when we assess learning, we we always say, okay, it's, I want to know what you can do by yourself with no books. It's like like a like a sequestered jury, right? The idea is that you're not allowed to consult anything, you're not allowed to talk to anyone, you're not allowed to like do anything. You just have to spit it back. And again, in certain circumstances, that can be okay. But mostly what we care about in the real world are how can people communicate and talk? How can they, uh, you know, they should be able to, in the real world, you would look something up in your book or on your phone if you need it. So for me, after COVID and watching how weird it was, how much like our kids just had to sit there, you know, not checking anything, although they really had a screen, most of them were looking things up on the side, you know, off screen when, when the teacher doesn't know. But how can we try to create learning environments that are demanding in the same way that a real world would be. So really letting people use language in sophisticated ways that they would, um, you know, that like you would in, in sort of the normal uh, world. Um, participatory design, um, something I'm trying to do a little bit more of is having uh, youth also help either designing the assignments or designing uh, materials like having them design games or design what they want their assignments to be in order to improve how we do instruction. Um, again, I was struck by how rote everything is and how it was a sort of factory model and how cheap most of that is, right? So if you want to just, if you want to have learning experiences where you just learn something rote, like there's an infinite number of YouTube videos out there, right? Or there are other, uh, content is kind of free now, but it's this relationship and advising that we can do as teachers that is harder to do. So something I'm trying to do is have students design um, much more. And then finally, getting people involved in authentic, meaningful practices, again, which is not always easy, but trying to really break down the walls. So having something I'm trying to do a little bit more of is having my students go out and you know talk, find people, talk to people. So I teach a lot of game designers right now, so I'm having them you know, go find someone who's in the job that you want to have and uh, maybe go find people on LinkedIn, go find 10 of these people who have that job, find out how they got there, do research on that. Um, and I think there might be some similar kinds of opportunities for language. So um, for language educators, and then um, hopefully we'll be able to do some Q&A soon. Um, I would argue that some pretty good to okay games or game-like things for language learning exist. You know, stuff like Duolingo, Duolingo, again, they give us a sense of progress. They break things down into degree, discrete skills. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm sure there's far more expertise in this room than, than I have. But I think that, you know, they can do those things okay, right? Those, those things now kind of um, exist. Um, what I'm trying to think about are how can we use technology to support social interactions outside the classroom? And even by technology, I guess I might mean like, like work, even like clipboards, right? So you can do, you know, something as simple as getting people opportunities to go outside, which again, I was really saddened, like my kids in science class. Um, and I, this is not to slam on teachers because I, I, my teaching was not always even even the C gets a degree and sometimes we were all slammed. But, you know, it's not like my kids were going outside to like uh, do backyard science where you look and count like birds. Those things exist, right? We have curriculum where you can kind of go outside the classroom and do things. And so um, 
I would like to try to do more of that myself, right? Trying to think about the world as an as a the world is your game board to use our example there. Um, oh, the, the other one is of course leveraging games kids already play. There's some research on uh, games as L2, you know, learning environments, people using the immersive quality of games to play games in a second language. Uh, one of my former students, Clara Fernandez, who's also a game developer now at in um, NYU in New York, talked a lot about playing um, mystery games or narrative games, uh, games that have a lot of language in them. Uh, she was Spanish speaking, um, but she learned English, I guess, through a lot of playing games like this. And I know there is some research, I'm, again, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I know there is some research of secondary use of media for this more immersive qualities for um, L2 vocabulary in particular, but that would be a, something I would do. And then thinking about, um, ideas for them to either write reviews, translations, paratexts. Uh, paratexts are, you know, texts around it. So imagine like um, writing something about your Animal Crossing gameplay or in getting involved in, in uh, uh, maybe like an Animal Crossing community in another language um, as a way to develop your, your learning skills. Um, so find or finding ways to participate in, in fan culture. A colleague of mine here at UC Irvine, Rebecca Black, did some work around fan fiction uh, for language learning, particularly in Japanese and English. You see a lot of this going back and forth as people want to participate in fan communities um, and looking at how they would give feedback for writing. Um, so I know this is all really tough to do because it's not like it's not like our um, standards slow down. You know, you have to try to find things that are matched to different languages. Because I'm sorry, different learning goals because you need to cover everything. So um, I know that these can be very difficult to do. Um, but something I would maybe think about trying when I think about my my own son learning Spanish. I, something I think about is it would be interesting for him to have an assignment or two that might be like watch, he loves basketball. So maybe, I don't know, watch some basketball games on the English language channel. Um, Cause we have TV channels. There's, you know, broadcasts that are in a second language. So thinking about ways he could immerse himself more um, in addition to the work he's doing. So um, those are some um, ideas. Um, another kind of thing I think about with respect to games and maybe just leave it on this is that in general, um, we think about classrooms as more like safe sandboxes, right? Where you are learning things like I mean, Duolingo would be the safest of safest, right? Um, something I was pushing myself to was to go, you know, go to the taco truck and order something actually in Spanish, right? That's the authentic participation. So can we use games or other technologies as scaffolds to help people do this? And I think that's maybe why I like that Mentera example so much is that it's using technologies, again, which can be even just a clipboard to encourage people to get over this divide toward doing some authentic participation and connecting to people. Um, and then the second is consumer to producer. So, you know, thinking with games have the ability to think with, um, you know, to, sorry, you're, you're starting by learning or, or uh, taking in information, but those examples like those neighborhood design games are thinking about kids as designers or producers who are starting to also then create information or create text um, using something like games, right? So it's something you can do with games um, are having them create either levels or designing designing games, even if it's on paper, right? You can have um, writing interactive adventures, something I can, we can talk more about if you're curious. There are tools like Twine that make narrative-based games much easier that don't really require programming. So that's another kind of thing you, you could probably do uh, sooner rather than later. Um, but I think it's a really rich place for exploration. So I'd love to hear more about what your questions are and what, what kinds of things you're doing. Um, okay, this is, a, I, I guess I, I, then I'll really shut up. Uh, the last thing we do, and we do games in other classrooms, one way we think about it is by first playing a game, then exploring, then studying, and then building. So the, many of our curriculum go this way. So if I were, um, if I were um, uh, doing a, a, a unit around, say, food, I might think about first playing a game or doing something in language where you're just uh, uh, raising their interest or learning something about it. Next, going to explore, like, okay, go find, um, go find some media or something where you can learn a little bit more about that topic, then going to study it on their own, 
and then finally building and making something. Um, this is what we do in science, and it may be helpful for language. Um, I guess the idea, though, originally, you might want to really end the last one, I guess, would be much more like authentic participation, you know, really doing something where you are actually engaged in interaction. So, um, yeah, so there, there we are. That's, that's my um, slides, um, acknowledging my various funders over the years. But I'd love to hear what kinds of things you're interested in. Thank you so much that there was so much there. I'm sure we will have some questions and there is a question in the chat already. Uh, if you end your screen share, that would let us all return to gallery oh, thank you. view and yeah. see each other's faces. So uh, Namiko had a question about inclusive education and she asked what kind of UD games would be more accessible to, for all learners? It's a great question. Um, and that's an area that's in a lot of transition right now. Um, there are technologies for, I know, for um, people um, uh, for sight. I, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not going to use, I'm going to use not good language. So help me here. Um, but people who uh, either, I guess, blind or deaf or degrees of, of those conditions. Um, I know there are. Um, I know that there are uh, tools that are being made to help people play games as well. Um, and there are some design guidelines that designers use. Um, there are some games that are just difficult to be, to be uh, played um, with different conditions, but there is, a, um, there is a design, kind of a UD design guideline that I know some designers have started trying to at least do play testing with people um, um, who might not have, you know, who might need assistance, either sight and visual. And generally, the belief is that it leads to better games because you are um, using, uh, like, if you, the more you're using sound, you, you get a far richer game experience. So um, there's, um, but there's a long way to go. And I know I've, um, I've got some colleagues here who are really um, among the world's expert in, in UD design and accessibility. And so we're, um, I know that we actually need to do to do better. Neurodiverse learners, thank you, yeah. I, I play board games a lot and I think it's something board game designers are thinking about more and it's led to some interesting games, unique new game designs. Uh, yeah. Are there we, any we other- design, We design all of our um, neighborhood games first as board games. And we did once, we did a, study of the board game versus the going out in the real world. And um, they did about the same. The only trick about the board games is they, they actually are, a, you forget how much work they are to actually assemble, put up the pieces. And that was the one thing that struck us. It was actually almost more difficult to use the board games because of that, but um, yeah. Are there any other questions? Feel free to use the Zoom hand raise feature. I see Namiko has her, has a hand raised again. Oh, sorry, can I speak? Is that okay? Yes, yeah. sure. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Actually, I'm so thrilled uh, to have listened to this presentation because I've been to a lot of uh, game, uh, so-called game experts or people who are obsessed with games. And then sometimes I feel like they have lost the, the uh, essence of why we do play games. And I was thinking about my learners who are playing games remotely. And I thought when they're back in the classroom face to face, the last thing they probably wanna do is do something in front of a screen. Because one of the things that we talk about all the time now is the importance of social interaction. So when you talked about creating games as a way to then interact with the community, I thought, yeah, that really is the essence of why we do play these games. Uh, you mentioned Duolingual and I use it too, but one of the things that kind of turns me off about that game is it focuses so much on grammar translation and also language accuracy that it really kind of puts me off. And then if I, you know, make enough errors, I don't have a chance to kind of recover until like, you know, four hours later. Um, so those kinds of things, I, I hope that um, when we as educators think about it and collaborate with game creators, um, hopefully we can solve some of those issues.
Well stated. And I, I have come around to um, really appreciating that first, the first part you said about the why we bring to games and um, the word that I don't think you said it, but the word that popped to mind is either joy or play. Um, and again, having, I've just started jumping into the, some of the literature and it, there really is a lot there that it's funny. I probably 20 years ago, I probably would have said, of course, but now I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's why we're doing this. Um, so yeah. Um, I totally uh, agree. Listen. Uh, oh, oh, real quick about the course about digital resources and game design. Um, yeah. So, um, it, are you thinking? Are you interested in um, uh, digital or any of it, or paper based or board games? Um, there are some great books now on game design um, that are really good. There's a number of excellent YouTube videos. Um, I'm always happy to share any of my uh, syllabi. Um, I suppose I was thinking of, of digital. Okay. Yeah. So for digital, um, um, there is a series of, uh, okay. So um, there's brackies. So a lot of people right now are building digital or building in unity is what most of what most people do. Unreal Tournament actually now has a relatively learnable interface. Um, oh, for and for text-based games, there's uh, Twine. Um, so I would say Twine, there's like Twine. I'm just writing out so you even got it in there, uh, Unreal or Unity. Um, and if you're building in Unity, those Brackies tutorials I mentioned are really good. Um, there's the game design subreddit is actually pretty good. Um, there are, um, there's a really great series of YouTube videos called the Game Maker's Toolkit um that um i've had a number of veteran game designers say the first thing they would do is if they were teaching was like have a, a, a game major just like watch all of them <laughs> and i was like really is that good good to know um uh there oh there's a series called extra credits it's also quite good uh, there are now also a number of books um uh, uh like a game game design workshop is one tracy fullerton uh, wrote that she leads the program at USC, which is uh, among easily among the best. Um, someday we'll catch up to them, but may maybe. But um, but there's a number of game. That's a really good one. That's a good game design book. I'm looking over at my shelf here to see what else I have. Um, but that's kind of what I would recommend. I would recommend, and that I would. The other thing I would try to do is find back to our peer thing. If there's any way to find a group of people who are um, interested in in game design, so you're just able to play and like board games even you know discussing them sharing and and that can be really helpful um gosh one of my former students matt gatos was in um uh, was in korea also and just um was doing board games for younger students and just just left for i think singapore but anyway It wasn't a question, but I noticed Jocelyn wrote that she appreciated the design insights in the presentation, but she really liked the emphasis on the social aspects. Uh, yeah, I, I found that so stimulating and so exciting. And I think I'm coming away from this session with some really great ideas about making embodied experiences. Uh, you know. One, if you're interested in that, um, another uh, thing I would recommend is this, uh, I just, I could find the link, but Aaron Camarado and Raf Costa wrote a paper called the Trust Framework for Games, if you Google something like that. And it is, if you're interested in social dynamics of games, it is really, really smart. Um, I, I find myself coming back to that all of the time. And it's fun, they, they basically just looked at all, a lot of research on trust and groups of people and games. And um, it's one of those things, it's just like a, a fun read where you learn a lot and then you probably can apply some of it to your teaching, game design and maybe life. Like it, it, for me, it's been really, really helpful. Bingo. Thank you. <laughs> and Raf is one of the, I don't know if anyone here knows Raf, but he was the lead designer of, uh, of, you know, like games like World of Warcraft massively. He, he's probably the, 
the most knowledgeable person of games of that sort. So he designed Ultima Online, uh, EverQuest 2, Star Wars Galaxies. He's got a new startup that just raised a bunch of money. He's um, a, a very friendly, thoughtful person. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, peace promoting games. There, there have been uh, a couple of um, high profile games for impact sort of games. Um, there's one um, that the name I'm forgetting. Uh, well, I mean, it might even call peacemakers or peacekeepers. Um, that was built around um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, what's interesting? What's interesting about the people who the the best some of the best work around peace promoting games tends to come from people who have people playing games that have conflict in them that could involve war, but then stepping back and saying, okay what did we learn from that? So I, I used to teach with the Civilization series, which I know has its issues because of its expansionist nature, um, which we could kind of, you know, I can, I would love to talk about. Um, but um, something we, I noticed from that is that uh, many of the kids would walk away after playing, um, talking about, um, oh, I guess just talking about war in a different way, particularly um, particularly the ethics of countries like the United States, you know, what they engage in. But there's a, there's a longer story. So um, I would love to see if there's more out there. Um, there. There would certainly need more. It's something that people are starting to, this next generation of game designer is starting to try to look more broadly, I think, finally, toward sorts of sorts of games that are not always around armed conflict or human violence, let's say. Craig had a question, but we are going a little over time and I know our next speaker has arrived. Um, he had a question about websites that are also games that can be ac accessed online. He likes GeoGuessr. I also love GeoGuessr. Um, if you had any ideas, maybe we could share them quickly, but that would also be a great thing to follow up on on Discord, I think. Yeah, you know, I don't offhand. Um, yeah, I, I, I really don't offhand. Uh, GeoGuessr is a great one. I think let's go share some ideas on Discord about that because I would love to have more things like GeoGuessr. Uh, I think perhaps we should wrap things up, but I'm going to share. We have a lot of links and resources to follow up on. I'm just also going to put in the link to Kurt's speaker information page where you can find a lot of things, including his article in the English Connection. And I think it's really clear that uh, a lot of us got so many things out of this presentation and we had a lot of questions and we have a lot of useful resources now. So let's all give a really big thank you to Kurt for his, for his session. Thank you. Thanks for having me.